introduce the concept of the difference between solvable problems and complex challenges. So solvable problems are things you can do. I'll give you an example. Uh, applying for a new passport. It's a bit of a pain. You gotta fill out a bunch of forms, go get a picture, do all this kind of stuff, but it's solvable, right? Not a problem. Complex challenges. These are more difficult things. Could be like making partnerships work between universities and industries. It could be, uh, I don't know, uh, inaugurating and launching a brand new faculty in the university. Uh, things that are, need multiple solutions, there's not really the best practice for exactly what you want to do, and you're never done. Yeah, so that's the difference between the two. Does it make sense? Some of you are nodding. No one's asked a question yet, so I'm not sure if it makes sense or not. Please stop me if it doesn't make sense. I can probably just let you explain it. If I don't know the answer, then we'll let you know me try to answer instead. Okay. So, this is a model then to discuss this sort of environment to not change. And I'll see if I can explain it, but I mean, now we're in school, so I remember my economics and I graph a little bit. So on the left here, on the, you know, the, the axis, you've got the close to agreement at the bottom and then the far from agreement at the top. And here at the bottom X, you've got close to certainty and you've got far from certainty. So those are the four dimensions we're talking about, okay? So things that are close to agreement and close to certainty, those are simple and solvable. I will give some examples. Okay. Things where we know we have to do it, we agree we should do it, but it's hard to do. Complicated. These are the complicated things. Things where we are, it's certain what the result will be, but we are uh, far from agreement, that's political. I will give some examples of that as well. Yeah. That's the zone of complexity. Okay. In between, that's where it's both we're far from agreement and it's also far from certain. And then the end of chaos. I'm very close to the edge of chaos most of the time, I would say. So this is a model. Now there's many models. This is one that, uh, that we borrowed from somebody named Ralph Stacey to discuss. It, it, I mean, it looks great about some of the research done by many of these uh, leadership uh, Change management and professors. It gives you models with, uh, or with which you can discuss certain problems. Is it one model better than the other? I don't know. But the, the problem is to discuss something complex, you need to have some way to organize the problem, which I'm sure you guys are going to do it. So, what are some examples? For example, and I have tried, as because I can't give examples that might be relevant for you here at UTF. But they don't let me know if I was right or not. Let's see. But uh, simple and solvable ones like upgrading your PCs or grading exams. Yeah. Right? I think those are simple and solvable things. Do you grade exams anymore? Is there such a thing? Yeah. Stressful, yeah? Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay, what's another example? Complicated. Make sure our accounting practices meet new compliance standards. So I understand that just like Ericsson, Ericsson has to implement some new accounting standards from the 1st of January 2018. ETM is also doing something. Yeah. We have to do it. It's certain that we'll be able to comply to the accounting standards, but it's complex to get done. Yeah. The political zone. Negotiating the budget. Who to appoint a particular position. These are the, the political area, right? It means it's certain you're going to get a result, but to get the agreement to the team might be more difficult. Yeah. And then the zone of complexity. This is like implementing a reorganization. This is trying to improve the efficiency process end to end from the, the whole uh, the whole chain, maybe opening new faculty. That's the so the complexity edge of chaos, that's just like everything is up in the air. Yeah. I don't know, imagine merging two universities. That would be chaotic, I think, right? 
Does it happen? It happens, huh? Yeah. I mean, Ericsson's gone through a number of uh, acquisitions and mergers. I mean, every time it's just very chaotic. That's all. Fundamental change in the funding model, and it's also potentially leads to some chaos. Yeah? Yeah? So, uh, so there's a way, uh, does it make sense? Does it feel like your life? So, so that's a change model, and maybe, uh, I don't know, do this. I will leave that there for now, and I'll come back and uh, discuss it. So, that's to discuss a little bit about our environment, and I think it's very relevant for a company like Ericsson. Uh, I believe it's relevant for you here at the university. I think it's relevant for many organizations, because that's the world we live in now. It's very, very volatile. So let's think about what the implications are on both team members and also you as a leader. So for the team members, it's what we talked about a little bit. I mean, uh, things like global competition for jobs. I mean, it must be true in Malaysia, right? I mean, it's not that only Malaysia is a university in Malaysia. I mean, it's a pretty popular place for lots of nationalities to come from Malaysia, right? To get education. But of course, that's going to mean that uh, everyone is getting a better education, which means the global, uh, the global competition for jobs becomes tougher, right? This is an example. There's in, take care. In uh, the corporate world, there's a constant downsizing, restructuring, reorganizing because the business is changing so quickly that if you don't adapt as a company to that, you'll go bankrupt. And then no one has a job and then everyone's unhappy. So you have to do that very quickly. Uh, constantly, your skills and competencies are outdated. It happens to me all the time. I mean, every day I come to the office and have a new discussion with the team and I realize I don't know, I don't really understand enough of what they're talking about and I have to also update myself. Things are happening outside of our control. So our sphere of influence becomes smaller and smaller in this very changing world, the amount that I can really control. And people, you will notice, uh, in your students who really struggle with change, really, really tough when you don't have that much control of these things. So that, that's tough. So there's a few things here, and of course it can lead to more stress and, uh, let's say, a lower levels of well-being. And that, of course, will affect overall these things in team performance. So it's quite this one important implication. At the end of the session, I'll talk about the types of things we do in our executive team to, to try to deal with this, uh, not just with work. For leaders, it means we always want to do more with less. You're always asked to do more for less, right? You uh, have to make many decisions when the answer is not clear. So it's not like a math problem. Right? Leading is not the math problem or something. Leading is not cleaning out your inbox and emails. Leading is dealing with complex stuff. I will come back to that, but I mean, essentially your job as a leader is to deal with complex stuff. That's what you do. The other stuff someone else should be doing. Yeah? So, uh, so you're constantly there after experimenting, finding out new ways, and you have to continuously learn. So it's it's tough for both the team and the leader of the team. So everyone is, is miserable when they try to deal with the new, uh, the new situation. So there's a guy named Bjorn Afterstam who uh, has come up with a model which I'm going to come to here. But I mean, he says something that the biggest challenge facing organization leaders today is not to have the most clever strategy, the best vision, or the latest business model. It's how to be skilled and capable in sustaining oneself in a state of constant change and no permanence. So that's a completely different type of leadership. It's not about this is what we do. It's not the uh, barking orders. It's something uh, different that we have to do as uh, leaders. I'll keep it on the screen see if I can share. Does this feel like the real challenge for leaders? Right. What I tell my team, and I mean, you can tell you that, you know, when you 
if I catch them, which would not, but if they catch themselves doing the simple stuff in the bottom left corner of that model, which is like cleaning your email, returning phone calls, uh, filling out the, some of the administrative forms you have to do, if that's what your day is filled with, then you're not doing your job. Your day needs to be filled with that problem that you don't really want to deal with. It keeps sort of kicking down the road and kicking down the road. It's a bit of a pain. You don't want to do it. That's the thing you work with. And if you're not working with that, you're not doing your job. That's what leadership is. Leadership is like uh, when you get that first real responsibility, you have this kind of sinking feeling in your stomach and you realize the responsibility that you now have. You go, oh. Yeah, that's leadership. So I think that's. Uh, yeah, that's how I feel about it. So, in this environment then, where it's constant change, the demand of the team members and the leaders is something that we've never seen before, mindset is quite important. So, if you have a mindset that making your choice of where to eat dinner is a really, it's like the edge of chaos, yeah, you're going to have some challenges dealing with the change that uh, we're facing, right? So, mindset. So, I mean, you know, this is it's a, yeah, an inclination or a habit, or it's your mental disposition that you want to something. I'm sure you understand the term. Yes? Okay. The interesting thing is, our collective mindset shapes our culture. Collective mindset shapes your culture. So, if we have a mindset where we're open to change, we will have a culture that is open to change. If you have a mindset that's focused on sustainability, you will have a culture that thinks you know you don't try to waste, you turn the light off when you leave the room, and all this kind of thing. So, your mindset will, will set the culture. Does that make sense? And I'm coming to an important conclusion here. So, mindset matters now. And when you're leading teams, the mindset of your team really matters. Because with the certain attitude, with the, the culture and the behavior you have with the team, that's what gives you the results. Right? You need to have a well working team, but the, the mindset is what can give you the right the approach to the problems you're facing and give you the results. I think, and as leaders, and this is something that I always find very difficult, we are accountable for being the role model, for setting the mindset through our own behavior. And I mean, for me, I, I've never gotten used to it, and I, I always tell my team this, when you're running a big organization, uh, I didn't notice for a while, but then I realized everyone is looking at me. Which, I'm not so comfortable with. I mean, even a speech like this, I mean, you guys are all looking at me. Um, I'm talking. And what I realized is, you know, I'm a normal guy like anyone else. I have bad days. I don't have bad hair days, really. <laughs> Every day is kind of like that, but it uh, has been for many years. But I have bad days, so I can come to the office in a bit of a bad mood. Yeah. Where I can have a discussion with one of the customers that doesn't go very well and I feel very frustrated. But the problem is, is I mean, I'm human, I'm, I, and I let my emotions show, I'm a uh, relatively emotional guy, but the problem is, is that can have big impacts on the mindset of the team. And if I'm feeling frustrated, and, <clears throat> and I, uh, that often happens, but I show it too much and in not really the right way, I have now negatively impacted. And those 1,000 people are supposed to be serving our customers. They're supposed to be dealing with problems maybe 24 hours a day, things that have happened in the network that they need to take care of, or things that are happening with the software that we provided. And if they are uh, feeling like I am, all 1,000, we're going to do a really, really bad job. So that's why uh, I would say mindset matters. As, as a leader, you have a big responsibility to set the right job. That doesn't mean not being genuine. You have to be genuine. I mean, you have to be yourself. You have to also be mindful of how your behavior 
could uh, influence the disposition of others. It's not that I like them more than I look at them more, it's just that you guys are so far away. I'm just going to try to focus over here more. <laughs> so, with that in uh, mind, then, so here's a model to talk about different change in zones. Okay, so you've got a red zone, a passive zone, you have a green zone, and you have, or you have a yellow zone, which is the forced zone, and then you have the green one, the mastery zone. And this is, if you've ever read things about like flow and stuff like that, I think the green zone is similar, similar to that. I will give some, uh, give some examples, but this is an interesting model. Uh, we'll start to connect in a second. So basically, uh, you can find yourself, for sure, in all three zones at different times. Yeah. So, in the red zone, let me see if I have the right example. Yes. So, what's in the red zone? This is when someone says, "Oh, we got to now teach you quick though. This is rubbish." Yeah. That's what I said. It's never gonna work. It's impossible. So what do you do? As little as you can. Yeah. You listen, you're not really paying attention, you're trying to understand. You're demotivated, you're tired. And what you look for, you try to find examples of everything failing. Because of your belief, this is stupid, I don't want to do it. Yeah, that's the mindset. Imagine if you have a whole team in the red zone, and you're trying to get uh, some new change implemented within your, uh, within your department. How's that going to go? Have you ever experienced that before? Ever experienced it before? I said that right. Okay. That's the red zone. The yellow zone is more like this accounting standard we have to So we have to do it. I'm not very motivated by it. But I know I have to get it done, so I'm saying, okay, I just want to get this over and done with. I'm not sure if it's going to work. What am I going to do? Because my Chinese competition doesn't have to follow the accounting standards, so it's going to make life tougher for us. It's not fair, you know, those kind of things. So what do you do? Then you work really long hours trying to sort out the problem. Do lots of meetings. You guys do lots of meetings, do you? That's teachers. <laughs> what, what are you teaching them? <laughs> yeah, students just leave them. They'll, they'll work it out on their own, right? I have the same problem. People love me. Uh, it's interesting that the. One of the fundamental parts of the Swedish culture is uh, building consensus. It's a very powerful tool within uh, the Swedish uh, corporate culture because when you have a, a unit like this where we've been able to build consensus, then you're very powerful in terms of executing. But building consensus when it's not, let's say, working very well is many, many meetings, many, many discussions, and like 40 years pass and we haven't actually done anything. So it's uh, both good and bad, and they can lead. So I mean, like anything, like at least in my experience, the strength of a culture can also be its weakness. Yeah, so it can also be. But yeah, so I mean, this one, yeah, you're still quite reactive. And the way you feel, it's constant escalation, constant uh, urgent problems have to be solved. Yeah. And then you make sure you measure things on a balance scoreboard. You worry about your KPI. You don't spend time thinking about how it really made a difference. You just know, I hit my KPI. Right? That's the yellow zone. 